seems to be a sure thing, really, that after you graduated college and everything else, that you know, you'd get a job right after college. But given this economy and everything, it's not the case. If you're a print person, go out and try to get involved with broadcast. If you're a broadcast person, try, try to get better at writing because you need to be able to do it all. Very few jobs are gonna ask you just to go out and write a story. There are very few jobs in journalism out there right now where you're not gonna be asked to do everything. But you really need to be yourself because the people that are interviewing you want to work with the real you. Do your homework ahead of time and know something about the organization. It's not just enough, really, to call yourself a print major or a broadcast major or even online stuff because these days everything has all meshed together in some form or fashion. There is no better time to have this event than today. Um, the main reason we decided to do this event um, really is because it used to be a sure thing really that after you graduated college and everything else that you know, you'd get a job right after college. But given this economy and everything, it's not the case. In fact, I would quote, I would like to quote here from the Associated Press that 54%, this is an April 2012 article, by the way, that those with bachelor degrees under the age of 25 are either jobless or unemployed. So really with this stuff here, there is no better time to have this event than today. So what I hope that you guys will really get out of this is a greater understanding of not just what it's like to be in this industry, but to also really understand um, really the nuggets of wisdom that me and these alums here will provide in terms of what they're doing now and really how to get there. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce my panel of uh, all-stars over here. So Caleb Calhoun, he is a reporter for the Herald Mail, Herald Mail, Herald Mail, Herald, Herald Mail, Mail, yeah, right. in Hagerstown. Uh, Brian Kapur, he's a sports editor uh, for the Northwest Current and also a reporter for DCSportsFan.com. Laura Betts, she is a writer for NASA, the Goddard Space uh, Flight Center, and Esther French, she is the local editor for the Wheaton Patch. So guys, I'd like to thank you all so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules for joining me tonight. And I'd like to go ahead and start off with the fundamental question um, of the evening. So I'd like to ask you all, really, why, first off, why journalism? Why did you guys decide to enter this industry? Why did you guys decide to study this industry? Uh, what really got you guys into it? And anybody can jump in here on this. Okay, well, I got into it actually in high school. I um, grew up in a Memphis, Tennessee. It's a long ways away from here. But um, we, uh, I worked at a uh, high school citywide paper there uh, called Tina Bill, and it was just kind of a fun thing at first, but um, I got to do a heck of a lot more with it uh, into my senior year, and I started driving around. I was responsible for covering a lot of the sports programs in the uh, high schools, and I went to see a lot of the high schools in some of the um, impoverished areas of the city that I had never even ever been exposed to, and it just kind of gave me a light in my mind that you know journalism can expose you to a lot of different things. Everybody will tell you that you get into journalism to meet people, and you do, but you don't always meet great people. You meet insufferable people, too. In fact, for every nice person you meet, you're going to meet 10 people that you just question why you're even doing this no, job. That's, that's very true. <laughs> what is the challenge? Is there any challenge in really reporting in <coughs> impoverished areas as opposed to a lot of these nice suburbs, I guess? You know, not, not, as, not so much. You know, where I work in Hagerstown now, I, I, I do a lot of coverage in impoverished areas and they're honestly easier sometimes. More people are more really? willing to talk. Uh, out in the suburbs a lot of times people are a lot more reserved, funny enough. Yeah. And um, I've actually found it to be a lot easier going in just if I'm just doing a random story where I'm asking people a question about a subject, kind of focusing on a poll question, we'll just go I'll just go right into the heart of the city in some of the worst areas and talk to people because I feel like it's actually I don't know, they're more willing to talk. Brian, what about you? Um, I got into journalism when I was in high school, sophomore year. Um, I had enjoyed playing sports. I, I played basketball in high school. I was actually a center, believe it or not. Got to high school, everyone kept getting taller, and 
unfortunately I didn't. So then I tried out for football, and I was like, I'd rather write about this than get beat up every day. So I got into sports journalism and worked for my high school paper. I actually joined dcsportsfan.com, and I, actually, I won an award in high school that, was, that really opened up my eyes to a lot of things uh, from Al Newharth, who some of you might know from the Journalism 200 class, the founder of USA Today. They put together a uh, event down at the, the Watergate before the new museum opened up and got to meet a lot of journalists in events like this. And it was really encouraging to see and it really fueled my passion for journalism because for a lot, a lot of my time in journalism, I was a sports guy that wrote and somewhere along the way I became a journalist with an interest in sports and I think it's a good way to put different passions into it. Like with you, you had like the science thing and I, I think that's a great way to get into it is a way of expressing different interests. Cool. Laura, what about you? That's exactly the same thing for me because uh, for me, I always grew up wanting to be an ologist. I like, always wanted to study different things, but I could never really settle on one thing. So I think that's why journalism had such a draw to me, because here you could be covering stories on all sorts of things, and you have to become the expert on that particular subject. And so that's why I wanted to go ahead and... Uh, uh, the, the science that. writing is quite... I, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but the science writing is quite a job you know, from the whole broadcast. You majored in broadcast. I did major in broadcast, yeah. but I started in print. So I started in print, switched to broadcast, because I wanted to get that other skill set and to be able to do camera work and all that other stuff. And it's really helped me become a better writer, actually, because you know that you have to make things short, you have to make everything crisp, you have to make it really you know, compact, because if somebody is going to start reading an article nowadays, they're probably going to read the top, maybe top three paragraphs. So it's really helped. Yeah. Let me just add to that uh -huh. real quick. Yeah. Um, that's probably the most, maybe the most important thing you're going to hear tonight. Do whatever you can to do as much of both as possible. I, I totally agree. Um, you're going to, there is not, there, there are very few jobs in journalism out there right now where you're not going to be asked to do everything. Yeah, and honestly, let me just say that, um, Really, it's not just enough, really, to call yourself a print major or a broadcast major or even an online stuff because these days, everything has all meshed together in some form or fashion. So really, it's just important that even though you may be a print major, try, you know, try and see if you can work with a camera, even though something as simple as a flip cam or something like that, you know? Because those are the skills really these days that are actually needed and that's important in the industry. You can, so. If you wouldn't mind, I actually want to jump in on that. Yeah. Because I was a print major myself. I had uh, no broadcast classes. Uh, I really wanted to take broadcast. I wanted to double major in both, but they wouldn't let me. So <laughs> what I had done was I worked with the Diamondback my freshman year, and then I got involved at WMUC, the sports radio station. I had a talk show started doing play-by-play -play stuff and fell in love with that. I loved doing that and then uh, joined uh, Unwind Magazine. I don't know if that, you guys still have that, but it was a good place to continue to write while I did broadcast. And then even now with my job, I'm at a very dinosaur newspaper. We put a PDF online, but with my other job with DC Sports Fan, I go out and I shoot video, something I learned because I took a class with Kevin Blackestone and he encouraged us to do that. So I rented a camera out without any experience, played with Final Cut, figured that out. I use Final Cut and iMovie now pretty routinely and make some, some decent looking stuff. So even if you guys aren't getting opportunities in classes, if you're a print person, go out and try to get involved with broadcast. If you're a broadcast person, try, try to get better at writing because you need to be able to do it all. Very few jobs are going to ask you just to go out and write a story. On Friday nights, I go out, shoot photos at a football game, do video at a football game, and write about the football game. So you gotta be able to do everything. And it's just increasing your odds. The odds of getting a job yeah. now are low, so if you can do more stuff, your odds go up. It's, it's all about positioning yourself, really. And the writing is truly fundamental. You know, you cannot, <laughs> Even though things are meshing, the writing part is still fundamental. Even in broadcast, you have to write for broadcast. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Very true. 
Uh, Esther, I want to get to you. Uh, same question. Why did you get into this whole industry? Why journalism? Uh, well, I actually joined my uh, high school newspaper, and um, I realized that I loved having the license to ask people <coughs> questions without them thinking that I was nosy or getting into someone else's business. Um, they would respond to me because I was a journalist and I was writing a story for the student newspaper. Um, so I, I really liked that. I really liked being able to answer questions that I had for myself and being able to learn more about new things and then share that with other people. Wonderful, wonderful. And what, um, were you just a writer on the, on the paper or did you get up to like some of the other editorial positions like uh, news editor or something like that or? Oh, I mean, in high school, I, I mean, I was the assistant editor. Oh, uh, so, yeah. That was a long time ago. And a long time ago, yeah. I, that, and obviously a long time for me uh, as well. I got up to co editor in chief of my high school newspaper. Still very proud of that. <laughs> um, not to, not to toot my own horn or anything. Um, I want to move now to the discussion of you guys' jobs because I really want you folks to have a greater understanding of what it's really like to be in the industry on a day-to-day -day basis. So I thought that was important. Uh, Brian, I want to start with you uh, on this. Um, you have, you know, Northwest Current and the DC Sportsman.com. I want to start with the Northwest Currents. So let's talk about <coughs> Northwest Current. Um, my understanding is it comes out weekly, right? Is yes, it's, it's a weekly. It's a weekly stuff. Uh, circulation is about how Almost, much? I think it's about 70,000. Yeah, somewhere yeah. in that range there. Um, really, uh, take us through what a typical day uh, for you, or I guess a week for you, is like in terms of putting together the paper. Well, you guys got me a day off because today, tonight's usually when we put together the paper, so I appreciate that. But I'll start with Wednesday because Wednesday is what I would call recovery day because I'm usually laying out the paper till about 2 in the morning and I'll be heading back there from, from tonight. But usually what I'll do is Wednesday I'll kind of set the agenda for the week, go through, look at what the big games are, and if, if not a big game, who we haven't covered lately. The thing is you want to be newsworthy, but you also want to – get to some of the other schools that don't get as much coverage because we are a community newspaper so you got and moms. And I'm sorry Brian and it's high school sports. High school sports okay. yes. Although I get to do some pro stuff with alums from our area or our high schools as well which is pretty fun but yeah so I'll kind of set the agenda let our one staff photographer know what's going on and then I'll go and just cover games and usually I get to about three or four games a week for them and it, it's the strict print stuff, you know. You, you interview, you write, you go home, and uh, you email it in. And I also do a lot of photography, so sometimes what I'll do is, if it's a situation where I'm shorthanded, I'll have my photographer go to one game where I can call the coach and find out, you know, get the gist of what's going on, and do do a brief on that game. And on um, myself, I'll go to a game myself and do a article and write as well. So mixing it up and then we have the editorial process we actually use Google Docs we all submit that and then a couple of editors will read through that and then Tuesday night go in and lay that out and at our paper being a small staff we're about 10 and one is pregnant and stuff so it's more like five but uh, uh, what we'll do is copy edit every page <laughs> it's like five okay, let me let me clarify <laughs> She, she's one of the, the bigger <laughs> contributors to what we do in terms of editing, copy editing, and laying out. So she does the work of five people, is what I'll say. Yeah. But. And really, okay, I'm glad we cleared that up. So, um, with you know, your writers, what you said is more like five. I was going to ask, is it just you that does the sports, or is it just, um, do you have another stuff, like, some staff of writers that um, I just up. do sports and I occasionally need freelancers and look for interns so if anyone's interested in sports writing strictly print see me after class if you want <laughs> um, really you said with you know the newspaper you know it's quite the uh, dinosaur you know and all that really what is the challenge you know at this point as far as staying I guess relevance if you will, in terms of this whole changing media landscape? The, for the current specifically, it's almost like a magazine. If you think about it, it's a very niche uh, marketplace for the current. 
Uh, the main thing that our news reporters cover are ANC and committee meetings, say so the crazy cat lady screaming about a fence being put up next to her house, but that's what's interesting, and that serves our 70,000 circulation. So in the niche market, the dinosaur formula actually works. It's the same reason why magazines that are strictly print still kind of work, although the iPad's kind of changing that. And uh, <coughs> my boss, who has to be in his 80s, I, I wanted to do more online stuff when I applied, and it was almost like, get those crazy ideas out of your head, because he <coughs> is sticking with the old business model, and in that type of niche market, it's amazing. It, it still works. We fill the ad space, put out special sections with ads, and uh, apparently the dinosaur still has some kick to it. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. There you go. I just want to also get to your online stuff as well, the DC Sports, DCSportsFan.com. Tell us a little more about that. I think you did mention some stuff earlier with the photography, I think, and all that. But yeah. Give um, us some detail there. With them, I, I get to do it all. I started with them in high school and really got to grow with them. They started in 04. I started with them in 05, so I've been with them since the start. And I've gotten to cover every sport that you can think of at the high school level. Got to cover the Wizards, but... A typical weekend, um, as I mentioned on Friday, for Fridays, I go to. I actually go to two games. I'll go to a four o'clock soccer game or volleyball game, something at four, usually for the current, and then I'll go to a seven o'clock Friday night football game for the uh, sports fan, and I'll do photos and video for them. And usually my bedtime on Friday is about three a.m. So while you guys are out at Bentley's and Cornerstone. <laughs> Uh, I'm slaving away at my computer. But uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is with the writing and the opportunities I got by sticking with sports fans and kind of being loyal to them, aside from getting paid now, which is definitely nice, but we have a contract with News Channel 8, and on Friday nights I actually get to go on and uh, be a part of a high school sports show uh, at 11.30 on Friday nights. and. I have never taken a broadcast class, but what gave me the confidence, confidence and ability was broadcasting games at WMEC, because you've got to be able to improvise when you're calling a game. You never know what's going to happen. When you're on live TV, you just got to go with it. And never took a broadcast class, never read a teleprompter, but I had a co-host once, and I did it, and I never took a class for it. So one of the biggest things I would say to you guys is maximize this time while you have it here, not just in the classroom, but go out and join WMEC, join other <coughs> local things, join a patch, join a DC sports fan. And it really helps you. As great as the classroom is, you learn a lot outside of it in journalism. How quickly did you pick up all you know, the TV stuff? How quickly did you pick that up? For somebody who has not done you know, a broadcast class, how quickly were you able to, you know? Well, in our, in our long nights at the news bubble, with <laughs> yes. me uh, pounding away at the computer trying to figure out Final Cut, mm -hmm. a lot of it, it in, in terms of broadcast, in, in my younger days of like sixth grade and stuff, I enjoyed doing plays and acting, and I thought I was going to be an actor before I thought I was going to be a football player. Didn't work out, but the improvisation and being able to talk and you know, just being able to go with the flow really worked for me. Yeah. And, and then in terms of writing, so I have to write a script now for my highlight clips, and it, it's just all come full circle and having different skill sets. Very nice. Very nice. Um, Esther, I want to move to you next. Because um, I remember coming across, I, I read the, the College Park version of Patch. Uh, I, I didn't really have a choice because I had to do it for my online journalism class, but I still read Patch nonetheless. And I came across your stuff, I was like, whoa, you know, you're on there, you know. So how did you come across it? How did you come across the opportunity to do uh, Patch over in Wheaton? Um, well, actually, it was when I was um, doing a fellowship here at the University of Maryland with the journalism school. Um, was that the, uh, uh, which one, News 21? Yes, News 21. So that was an investigative project on um, food safety. And it just happened that um, one of the editors, who's also a professor here, um, knew the editor for uh, the patch sites in this region. And she had told her that she was looking for um, new editors. So. Um, Got my name in there, and that's how it oh, happened. There you so, go. I mean, friends with your professors. <laughs> they will give you job leads. <coughs> Networking is key, you know? Uh, what, is, what is it like for you covering Wheaton? I always thought that Wheaton was a very interesting area during my time uh, here at Maryland. So, what's like. Why, why would you say that? 
I, I mean, I, I'm not talking about the whole MS-13 and the, you know everything else. I'm not talking about that. But I've always thought that it was kind of sort of an up and coming um, in some parts, you know, especially with what's going on over at the mall and mm -hmm. everything. Um, I've always thought that that something about it is just so interesting to me. <coughs> so. Yeah, so actually what drew me a lot to being the patch editor in Wheaton, and I'm not sure, does everyone here know where Wheaton is? Okay, you're all nodding. Um, is that I've lived in Montgomery County for my entire life, and um, in, in Colesville, actually. And I had always driven through Wheaton, but never really stopped to check it out. And so I was intrigued by the fact that here was this community that was really just 15 minutes away from where I lived, and yet I knew so little about it. Um, and so I, I really wanted to take that opportunity to get in depth and, and get to know the people who lived there and the businesses um, that operated there and uh, really go beneath the surface and bring out Wheaton's uh, hidden gems and its good qualities and show people in Montgomery County. Wheaton's a, a good place to be, a good place to go out to dinner, a good place to live. Okay. And I, my understanding with Patch in general is that you're the local editor and the local editor, from my understanding, does a lot of the stories, a lot of the lab work. Is that correct? Would that be fair to say? <laughs> uh, I wear a lot of different hats. Yeah. So I, I write stories. Um, I edit stories that are submitted by freelancers. I take photos. I take video. I approve blog posts that are submitted by community members. I manage the community calendar. I manage the announcements section where um, users can submit announcements. Um, I manage the social media accounts, so I'm updating Twitter, Facebook, so I'm doing a lot. And you haven't got an office, like, per se, really. You, it's just you and yeah. your laptop. Yeah, so I, I work from home, I work from Starbucks, I work from a library. Yeah, it's pretty very much fl it. Very flexible, I guess, so you can say, <laughs> yeah. And how has the community responded to uh, what you guys are doing? I mean, there's, there's been a lot of positive feedback because, um, I mean, what Pacho's mission is, is to provide hyper-local news, so drilling down into specific communities and um, giving people in that community a, a chance to come together in one spot to talk about their town and talk about the issues in their town. Um, so people, I think, have really em embraced Patch as sort of this platform. For yeah, the and I also see you know, a lot of video, um, multimedia, a lot of interactive elements you know, in there, you know, and all that, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think that's definitely very important to kind of differentiate um, because, you, as I said, this is a very much a community stuff. And I know, Brian, you know, you're doing... I was community. just thinking that's, that's how they're going to kill my paper. <laughs> do, you think, do you think that... I don't think of it as complimentary, though, because, for example, I don't cover any high school sports. Yeah. That's what you do. So. I know some, some of the patches do, because like when I'd be at to walk down into Matha from here, mm -hmm. there'd be a, a patch reporter there. So Right. So, I mean, I know that the patch reporters in Montgomery County, what they do is they ask readers, you know, each week, oh, you know, we have our poll. Which game in the county this week would you like to see featured on patch sites? And then people vote, and then they go. Okay, well, I want to get you next here with the Herald Mail. Tell us about that. Tell us more in detail as to uh, what you're doing with that. Well, it's kind of evolved. I mean, literally in the year and a half. I graduated in 2010, um, December, and it's kind of evolved in the year and a half since I've been there. Um, I'm basically now I'm responsible for updating, breaking traffic, crime news for the web. I'm responsible for. We have a TV station now. Just just to give you guys a rundown, we're talking about multimedia journalism here. I work for a newspaper that has a TV station, and I was a broadcast major. And my primary responsibility is updating breaking news online. So it just kind of gives you a rundown of yeah. where journalism is going. And, um, but I also am responsible for uploading uh, broadcast packages at least, one, uh, at least one or two a day to the web, plus mm -hmm. writing a couple of feature articles a day, um, either assigned by my editor or figured out, figured out by me. So it's, it's very much a flexible job that kind of depends on the I mean, the, uh, the thing is, you've done broadcast, and... Uh, is that really an advantage for you relative to, say, some of your peers? Because you've got the opportunity, to, like, you know how to frame a shot, you know about composition, you know about, you know, all this stuff. So It's a huge advantage. I mean, starting the TV station, what they've tried to do is have um, reporters, every print reporter has to put a package together, a video package, with their story. And, you know, a lot of them are kind of 
you talk about the dinosaur era. A lot of them are kind of stuck in that era. Yeah. And um, ever since we started this TV station back in July, I mean, my story count's been ridiculously high because my editor knows that, like, I'm the only one that actually has experience doing both writing and and doing broadcast. So that's um, that's kind of just... So that's, uh, that has really helped you, obviously, more than it... Obviously, it wouldn't hurt. Yeah, and I mean, it's... Um, we're a little more old school. The newspaper, actually, the selling of the newspaper is still what makes us the most really? profit. Yes, the newspaper still, the content in the newspaper is still where, where the profit comes. But we're moving towards the web. We're no longer even printing from our own building. We're printing in Frederick, even though I'm in Hagerstown. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm sure, I don't know if you guys have read, but a lot of papers in the South, I think the Birmingham News and the yeah. times PQ and have cut down to two or three days a week and yeah. the rest a lot of the time papers have online. Really, a lot of papers have really cut down uh, uh, over the years because really the online aspect is really has been, folks, you know, really where it's at. They're getting the same news and they're not having to spend the money to print the paper. Because so. people, I think people want the immediacy, you know. It becomes old news, you know, and all that if you have to wait the next day, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, my... Um, just to give you an example, one of my primary things that I cover a lot is accidents yeah. or a fire. You know, the first thing I'll do is I'll hear my scanner, you know, there's a major accident on, interstate, on, on the interstate. So the first thing I do is I send a quick update to the web, like two sentences. There was an accident on Interstate 70 at the 32 mile marker. Police were responding at this time. That's all we have confirmed right now. And then like literally when I get on the scene, I'm sending at least three or four updates back into the newsroom so they can update it on the web. And it's, you know, it's new facts every time. Yeah. So. The only important thing is make sure you're accurate. <laughs> exactly. That will never change in journalism. That's one thing that will never change. Exactly. Even on tw uh, even on Twitter, especially. I mean, yeah, you can delete your tweets, but people who are smart enough to, you know, print screen, you know, print screen, then you know. Yeah, those tweets. You're screwed. Online tweets and emails, guys. Facebook statuses. They don't go away. You can delete them, but they're not. No. They're not going away. If anybody knows you that's important, that that could have an impact. So you may want to take off some of those drunken photos, you know, <laughs> and, and everything, you know, from there, you know. Um, it's okay if you put your drink down. It's actually classy to put your drink down. You yeah. Yeah. Picture, so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. Fair point. Um, Laura, I want to get to you now. Um, you're writing for uh, NASA. That's correct? Yeah. Tell us about that, how you got it and everything. Well, when I came to journalism school, I knew I wanted to be a science writer from day one. Uh, just because I love science so much and I love talking to strangers and it gives me the ability to do both. Uh, so I knew I wanted to work at NASA, so I started applying. But before that, I did six internships during college. I had all sorts of different places, like National Geographic, Channel 9, uh, a legal internship, uh, Secretary of State's in International Affairs in Maryland. Like, I ran my course of every career opportunity, I think, possibly evaluating different things. But being able to say that I had all of these different skill sets and all of this different knowledge of different things really led <coughs> to me getting the job. But it wasn't an easy road by any means. I applied in August, and I kept applying. So I got phone interviews, and I kept applying to the same people. And eventually, they gave me an interview. But it was because I didn't give up, and I kept asking. And I think when you're looking for a job, and eventually you all will be, it's, it gets a little disheartening when you're applying and applying and applying. And Nowadays, because of job sites and because of the way you're supposed to apply to things, sometimes everything gets lost and you feel like nothing's working out, but eventually it works out. And I, what is supposed to happen does. So I love working at NASA. The people that I work with are incredible because it's amazing to be able to work with people that have been working on something for years and years and now you're talking to them when they're at the top of their game. So it's kind of an amazing place to work. And I really enjoy every day. Okay, guys, so what <coughs> is, in terms of providing some insight to these guys before we talk about 
the internship aspects and positioning yourself into J school. Before we move on to that, what is the one thing that people should be looking for when they look for a job? What should they look for? You mean should what should these people take into what account? What these what should these folks, all you guys over here, uh, take into account when looking for a job once it comes time? Well, diversity. I mean, I mean what we talk, what we've all talked about. You got to be good at everything. Um, and I would also talk. I would also say, looking for a job is a lot. You talked about this a second ago. It's a lot different than looking for an internship. It's the most <laughs> unorthodox thing you're going to do because there's no science to it. You know how many, how much advice do we get from professors, guys, and different advice every day? This is what you do to get a job. This is what you do to get a yeah. job. And there was always something a little different there. And you know you, you know the, I would say things like you know send in your res. I mean don't just oh it's just send in a resume and a cover letter and you know clips or a pat or a resume reel don't just send that in and be like i did what i need to do follow up send emails again call if you have to there were a couple times where i where it said no phone calls y'all know those sites where they're saying no phone calls please yes i still called and sometimes and a couple times i got called in for an interview even uh even though it said no phone calls i mean I, you got to do whatever it's going to take to get that job short of killing people or killing your competitive <laughs> advantage but <laughs> yeah would, would you guys concur with uh, Caleb's advice? Yeah. Um, one social media site that maybe you guys aren't on yet, but I highly encourage is LinkedIn. Oh, yes. If you don't have oh, one, yeah. get one right now on your iPhones if you have them or when you get home. Do it. Uh, it's Think of it this way. It's Facebook with a resume. and <coughs> People that want to hire you are on there and generally friend you. If you've had an internship, friend people you intern with, that'll connect you to their connections. And it's another way to network, and it's a lot more productive than Facebook for getting a job. I would, yeah. if, if you don't have it already, get it. Um, it's Absolutely. paramount. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, my thing is, really, you know, make sure you actually see yourself wherever you apply. Make sure you actually see yourself wherever you're at. I mean, that said, of course, there are times where you really have to take sometimes even maybe the less desirable uh, positions than what you originally envisioned. Because I know that there are some people in the past who have really wanted to be on air. They want to go on, get on Channel 9 or somewhere like that and be out there and report it. You know, but, but you've got to cut your teeth, you know, and, and everything else. So my advice would be really, you know, yeah, make sure you see yourself, you know, there all right. But as I said, with the way the economy is, you may have to take maybe less desirable positions. As Brian, we were talking before the, the start of the event. I know you wanted to really make a point about this. Yeah. Uh, if you look at my resume when I was leaving college, I had a USA Today internship. I had an NBC4 internship, um, um, among other things, the WMC, the Diamondback. And I applied for a job at USA Today, and I came in as a finalist for it. It was an NFL reporter job. And it was an editor that I had worked with during my internship, and they told me that they just need me to get some more experience. And it was like, I interned here, I interned there, I didn't really understand it. And then through DC Sports Fan, one of our other writers had the Northwest Current job, and they were leaving it. And I was kind of, kind of ready to move on from high school sports. I mean, I've done a lot of it, and I had thought about that. So for two weeks, I initially didn't even apply to the Current. And then, I was holding out for USA Today, and I, it just occurred to me, you know what, just get a job, you know? I, they want you to get experience, get experience. So I took the job with The Current, and I love it. I mean, I've gotten to do high school sports, but I've gotten to do more of it, and I'm really part of that community, and I, on Twitter, when I'm at a game, I'll get a bunch of tweets back. It's the only time I, my phone's really active is when I'm getting tweets from parents, what's the score, how many yards did my kid get, that sort of thing. So I, I know a lot of us, some people I graduated with got to go to ESPN, a handful got to go to a big name, but that's not gonna be everybody. And based off what I did, I thought that could be me and I was surprised that it wasn't me, but we're all, when we graduate, we all think that we can you know, immediately go to the big leagues, but Bryce Harper started in the minor leagues. So, I mean, everybody's got to start out somewhere and get that experience and, and move up. And the thing about it, 
I feel ready now for that call. If, if I get that USA Today call, or if I get a TV call, a Channel 8, and they want me full time, I feel better prepared for it because of what I've done now. So every experience is a good experience for the most part. Let me add to that just really, really quick. Yeah. Um, those people that we talked about too that got jobs at ESPN or those mm -hmm. big those big league places, we know them. They're not reporting guys. They're not doing any reporting. Yeah. They're doing these productions. No, they're not. Actually, what, even taking a reporting job in a smaller market is more marketable if you want to be a reporter than taking a behind the scenes job at a bigger market. Um, you know, yeah, if you worked at ESPN, it looks nice, but if you, if you didn't show any <laughs> skill to report, what, it doesn't matter. Uh, they yeah. want to see that you can report. So. Exactly, exactly. And I'm going to get to this in just a second, but I will say for those of you who really want to look into the reporting route, you guys really have to look at the uh, CNS bureau. So for those of you in that track who really want to go out there and report and all that, there's no better stuff than doing the broadcast bureau honestly but you've got to have a passion for it because i know that there are some people who just did not have a real passion for it you know um i really want to get to this next section here uh really talk about the whole internships because i know that there are folks who are going to be looking for those so laura you said that you did six internships yes. um you know how many internships among you guys did you guys <coughs> do esther I think I did three. Three? Brian? I'd probably say about maybe five. Count. Oh, God, okay. Hold on, give me a second. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not going to count. I'd say probably about six, too, yeah. honestly. More or less, I don't know. You know, is, is there real, what I'm trying to get at is, and anybody can jump in here, is there really a magic number, you know, in terms of how many internships you should have, you know? I found diversity to be the key, because I actually learned a lot of my video editing at... NBC. When I was at NBC, I walked in, I didn't know how to cut video, but they took my radio experience of cutting audio and worked with me there. I don't know if you guys watch uh, Lindsay Zarniak. She was actually a print major first. She's at ESPN now, and she actually helped, uh, helped me understand it and get on it. And I think one of the biggest things you can do is intern in different interests like, like what you did and different styles of media just to get a sampling of what you miss outside the classroom. Absolutely, guys. I mean, I interned at um, a magazine for Hispanic professional women, and then I did an internship at a medical news service, so those were completely opposite. So the style of the I think the key. Does, we have a question. It, it's a question about this. I want to know if the majority or entirety of your internships were unpaid. I was going to Unfortunately, to yes. Yes, yes all of them. Unfortunately, yes. I interned at Discovery, National Geographic, a news station, like all of those places were unpaid. But the experience that I got from them and the people that I met and the way that I could use different media, like Discovery, I was in their digital media department. National Geographic, I was working with researchers writing. So it's like the amount of experience you can get by diversifying and using different internships can really lend well. On the other hand, you can get paid internships in journalism. Well, here's my thing, though, because uh, I was going to actually get to this. Should that really be the focus of all you guys here, of all these guys here? Internships? In terms paid. of uh, paid or unpaid. Does I, it really matter? I think it matters on your situation, because if, you if mom and dad aren't paying your college tuition, and you are working at Plato's, I, I think it is a factor. But if you have if you have the back financial backing, go for anything. But I mean, it's different situations. And if you're you know working your way through college, doing whatever, and it isn't stripping or something. I mean, if you if you explain that to a potential boss, I, I think they'll understand and and see that that you are a hard worker. And that's the one thing I can't emphasize enough is just grinding and working hard. Um, that'll make up for a lot of things. You might not be the best writer, you not, might not be the best uh, at cutting video, but if you're willing to, to, to bust your ass, it, it goes a long way. Yeah. If you don't get called shipping, we'll help some with your college tuition, but. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyways, I, I wanna add to that, I wanna add to what he was saying real quick. Um, I had, you know, I didn't have all of my tuition paid for and I was an outer stater. I took out loans, I took out loans for, to help pay for my all of my classes and then obviously for a little bit extra spending money 
Not going to tell anybody to do that now because it's killing me right now. But if if you know if you man if if you're smart managing your money, then it's definitely a worthy investment to take an unpaid internship if you can't get a paid one. Because my best internship was me. I mean, I had USA Today and NBC Four, but also had Meet the Press, and yeah. I worked on Capitol Hill, and I'm. As far as internships go, I'll put them up against anybody, even though none of them were paid. Yeah. So. And my advice basically will be really make sure that the internship that you're actually looking at is actually relevant to what you're actually looking at doing. Okay. Now, of course, <laughs> yes, you want to spread yourself, you know, and all that. But ultimately, if you want to do broadcast work and all that, you've got to demonstrate at least some kind of, you know, knowledge there. I would also say consider doing an internship in your final semester. Okay, do an internship in your final semester because of the fact, well, I shouldn't say it's a fact, but, you know, there are some places that, you know, may actually be having some positions open as far as jobs go, and who knows, if you talk to your boss, you know, and all that, and they really like you and you make an impact, then who knows, you slide yourself right into a job right away. Now, I'm not saying that that's guaranteed, or anything, but you might want to consider that strategy, okay? Also, I know that this is now required for you all these days, but I highly recommend that people take the Journalism 352 class, the online journalism class, because that really spreads out your opportunity, okay, as far as which, you know, internships, especially for the internship class, what, 399? Um, that really spreads out your opportunity there as far as which stuff you can or cannot do, okay? Also helps with resumes. I mean, if you have a website to put all your stuff on, you don't have to email a million clips or a bunch of different things to people. You can exactly. Have, have a website, too, okay? And you can start something as simple as uh, WordPress or anything, and you have your stuff, you have your resume there, you also have some clips, things of that nature, because there are recruiters that do look at this kind of thing. You know, so make sure you have yourself, you know, a website in addition to, as we said earlier, LinkedIn uh, and everything else. So, yeah, absolutely. Now, the last one I want to really move on before we get to questions is the career fair. Here. So, I want you guys just very quickly to talk about, any of you can jump into this, talk about your experiences, you know, kind of, you know, what should these guys be thinking about as they get ready for the career fair? Have your resume. I mean, this is where you actually do need to have hard copies of your resume because you're going to be meeting people face to face and you're going to hand them something. And I mean, yeah, I mean, I usually never tell people this, but you got to really focus on what, how you dress that day. Um, uh, yeah, just properly. Yeah, um, yeah, just, I mean, not. Just, just like me. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. These are good examples, except for Caleb. Don't <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't wear this. this <laughs> Those two are great examples, and yeah, they're actually they're all, everybody here is a good example. Everybody looks great. Yeah. yeah. You know, not sure about the cheese, but uh, you know. <laughs> Don't wear this for job interviews, which I wouldn't myself, so. Yeah. Um, um, really, and should, the, and try to fake, um, also really master the art of the handshake, okay? <laughs> I've never heard that one before. <laughs> Well, you guys know me, so, uh, you know, you guys should know, because, uh, you know, the recruiters, I mean, it's the, it's the little things, okay? It's the little things that count, you know, in terms of people actually remembering you and making an impact. You don't want to be remembered for the wrong reasons when it's time to get a job, you know, and all that, so. I actually had the chance to sit on both sides of the desk as a student, because I graduated uh, May 2011, and then as a recruiter, because I was there last, last time I was there, I guess last fall, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. And I was sitting behind the desk looking at people to hire, because I, I need an intern. And it's amazing. Some of the resumes that I saw were like four bullet points of what they've done in their life. The journalism school has a great template, which I still use. Go use that template and fill it in and you'll be set. That's one of the biggest things. The other thing I would say is follow up. If you get a business card that night when you go home before you go to Bentley's, send an email to yep. whoever you met. Because <laughs> I did that with NBC after talking to them and I got a call in January. Oh, by the way, we have this internship. I was taking 20 credits to make sure I graduated on time. Broadcasting WMEC, 
but I'm not going to turn down NBC. So I did all of that. And I mean, that, that's the biggest key. Contact afterwards. If there's an internship you want, if you met someone, even if you didn't make a great connection, send that email because that email afterwards, that follow-up shows that I'm interested more than handing a resume because as, a, as someone looking to hire, if you get a resume, you're like, okay, neat. But if someone actually follows up, you're gonna respond. Um, is it too late? Like, how long is too late? I mean, I, ideally you'd send it within two days, but if, if you forget about it, whatever, over two weeks. I mean, think about it this way. You're trying to date. You're trying to, you know, you're trying to form a relationship. Are you going to call that girl the, like in two weeks and say, oh yeah, do you remember me from Bentley's? <laughs> I mean, come on. Unless you had a really great conversation. Yeah. Like if you had a really great conversation or something that was really noteworthy, so then there would be a reason for them to remember you, then maybe you can contact them after those two weeks. But you really need to make sure, sure that when you're having conversations with people, they're real conversations because... When somebody is interviewing you at these career fairs, they're also thinking, do I want to work with this person? Mm -hmm. And so you want to have, you don't want to be too showy and you want to be yourself. So that's another thing. I think a lot of people put on a persona when they're trying to interview, but you really need to be yourself because the people that are interviewing you want to work with the real you. So that's really important. And I mean, one of the ways to have a real conversation is to do your homework ahead of time and know something about the organization that you are going up to their table and, and talking with them. I've um, actually done that in every interview and I'm sure you have to. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. absolutely. So in the journalism school, I mean, they release a list of the recruiters that are going to be there. Yeah, so that's all, that's you know, all go down the list stuff. and make sure that you know something that you can start a conversation with when you go up to that table. And don't get complacent. I mean, I, I, not just the people at the career fair, like go online and research every outlet in this area and just email them if you don't see anything about interns, you know. Email, find out who the editor or the assignment director, whoever is, and be like, look, I'd like to intern here if you're interested. Yeah. I really like the, by the way, I really like the speed dating analogy because that's, that's exactly what it is. You have a lot of recruiters and all that. I understand you're going to be, a, you're going to be there. Yes, I'll be there at the patch table if anybody wants to come by. So, hey. And don't be afraid to go to the small tables. Like when I was there with The Current, People were like, I don't know who this is. I don't want to go up there. We actually hired interns the next day. So don't, NBC and all that is great. I mean, everyone wants those, but the smaller stuff, go there because they're the ones that have the power to really hire you right on the spot. You, you have that power, right? Oh, well, I mean, or I like, don't, but I know No, like you guys can do it real quick. Right. And like, that's how it was with us. Whereas NBC, they have to go through channel after channel, and you wait months to maybe hear back. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the smaller stuff, you get something more immediate. It's faster turnaround. And that doesn't mean you immediately mm -hmm. have to take it, but you, I mean, it's, you know, the more options you have, the better. It, ab so. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it is what it is. I mean, we've got a lot of recruiters, we've got a lot of people. I mean, yes, I do agree, you know, the small tables look at it, uh, you know, I don't want to go to, you know, go to, go to those. And uh, whatever year you are, because I remember I went like yeah. freshman and sophomore year really excited, and then after a while I was like, oh, it's just the same people over and over. Go every year. I mean, every year it's just more opportunity. You're the opportunity like, is huge, and uh, you know, journalism is really, to me at least, it's more about, it's not so much what you know, as it is who you know. But the connections that can help you in terms of getting the jobs and all that, that's what's important. In fact, one of the uh, technical directors that I work with, he said that you know this whole journalism industry, and especially broadcast television, is really one of the most, um, in his words, one of the most incestuous uh, industries that you can uh, be in. So um, there's that, so, you know. Um, when you're in college, it's the perfect time because you want to network at events like this. Any type of event like this, go. I mean. You got to network because while you're at the event, mm -hmm. you're still learning and learning how to do these things. So even if you network with someone and you see something you want to do, you have the opportunity while you're in school to get prepared for that potential job. Absolutely. And also, if yep. there's something you want to do, you should vocalize that. And then tell your uncles and your aunts and your, their friends and their friends' friends. And don't be afraid to just talk too much about what you want to do because I feel like ultimately 
half my friends, that's how they found their jobs because somebody managed to hook them up with the person that they needed to talk to. And also, with your emails that you send at the end of the career fair, you want to have your LinkedIn link and your website link, and everything needs to be like perfect. It needs to be how you want to present yourself. Uh, no, Attach but, your resume too. Uh, by the way, with the email, with the well, the points on the email, make sure that it's a, you know a professional you know stuff, not Sexy all this babe, you know, sexy, you know <laughs> all this stuff, you know. All this, these slutty, you know, type thing. Okay, great. Now, yes. Yes, I'm going to get it. There's a method to my to my madness. Okay, so now we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. All right. Now, we were the quirky um, loud people in the news bubble, by the way. Yes. <laughs> yes. We were the guys so, everyone hated. Yes. So we're going to ask. We're going to ask that uh, if you would have I I called you, you just stand, okay, and just address your question. So you were first, so, yeah. Um, what you were saying about contacts and people you know that they know, um, yes. hooking you up with people, if your friend has a contact for you, do you contact them first, or do you wait for your friend to let them know what's going on? Or I would ask your friend for their contact information and then email them or I would email them first and then ask to talk to them over the phone. Just about, even if it's just to talk about the subject. Say you want to intern at some place and they know of someone or something like that. It's always better to have that reference uh, instead of just directly contacting them and also to have that friend know that you're contacting them so then they can say, oh yes. And another big thing with that Informational interviews, guys, is the greatest thing that you can do. Like, just go, you can go wherever you want, really, to just have an informational interview about some subject or some place. You can go to any place you could practically intern and just sit there and have an informal interview about the place, about what they do there. Just be curious, be journalists. And just sit there and you know, be very questioning, you know, sit there and if you show that you're really interested and want to just look around and talk to them and really understand what they're doing and why they do it, then chances are you'll get an internship that way too. And that's the same for jobs, really. If you show the initiative to just show up and you know have an interview, but it's not like a formal interview where you just want to get a sense of what's going on, sometimes that turns into a real interview. You have a question over here. Yeah, hi, how are you? I'm Jack. Um, I was just wondering, what was it like to go from learning something in the classroom to being able to apply it in the workplace? Like, was it challenging? Were you excited? Like, it's a very, very good question. a really good question. The classroom helps with your skills a lot. I mean, it, it gives you the basic understanding of things. I think we all agree on that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And actually, the classroom, as far as the experience, uh, newsflash to all y'all. The valuable experience you get as far as learning in the classroom, as great as the experience you, we all got at internships is, what we learned in the classroom was actually more important as far as our skills went, I feel like. And now as far as internships go, if you're writing or reporting, then your skills get a little more refined. But the classroom does, gives you, does give you the basic skill set, but the only way to get better at it is to do it all the time. Um, I'm so much better of a writer than when I just than when I left here because I've been having to turn out two or three stories every single day, and it's it, it certain things become second nature and I think we all agree on that. Yeah, I think I for me I, I would say personally I think I've learned more if anything in the real world than I even have. I, I mean I learned a lot in, in this journalism school. Don't get me wrong, but I think a lot of the small details, a lot of the nuances, you know, especially for those of us that broadcast, you really get to appreciate more once you're actually out of the real world, I think. I'll do, yeah, one more. Yep, stand up. Uh, hi, I'm Emily Ann. Um, just to sort of go off on that, I have an internship right now that is not really related to journalism, so, but I have clips from like last year from 328 balancing, like publishing those clips with Patch. Um, and doing the internship was absolutely ridiculous. 
So how do you balance like having an internship that makes money and pays the bills versus getting the clips still to make yourself marketable? The summer, I mean, take your take your week off, whatever whatever you need. But the summer is really the time to grind and make an impression. During the school year, if you have an internship, it's great, but you do have the, all that outside stress as well. So if you're looking for a less stressful way, I guess, the summer is really the time to get into an internship. And you can do a couple internships during the summer too. But You don't just have to do one. And um, Yeah, I, I know exactly where you're coming from, and it turns out you do too, because we went through the exact same thing, and it is so stressful. I'll learn about and, um, too. Um, I'm sorry, but the one big thing when it comes to jobs, I mean, you're right, that does count, but a lot of that's into getting interviewed. Work on being able to be interviewed and being able to, be, to communicate with people. Um, I always said when I was hiring for a job anew, I was, really, I was really good at you know speaking with editors and people hiring, and I was like, if I can just get an interview, I know I can become a finalist for this, for this job or this internship. And um, you're right, the competition is fierce. But guys, there's a million internships in DC, and there's a million places that would use an internship, but don't like have a thing up, and you can just send them an email. Uh, by the way, in terms of like, you know, I know we're kind of deviating from the internships I put, but in terms of the jobs, journalismjobs.com. <coughs> yes. Journalismjobs.com. Write that down. I you was know. just on that site. Like TV jobs. Coming here. TVjobs.com too, actually, is a good one, but that yeah. costs forty dollars. So. LinkedIn. You can look for jobs on LinkedIn too. I did some of the paid ones, like jobs and sports, and work in sports. Yeah, yeah and, sports. and I yeah. ended up getting hired using none of those. Journalism jobs was great. I know Chris Harvey is now the internship coordinator, mm -hmm. so she is still is you know rest in peace, buddy. You know she still sends out all the. Uh, you know, internship opportunities and jobs, so pay attention to those emails. Um, one, one more piece of advice I'd give, in a job interview, it's a two-way street. Ask them about what you'll be doing and see if it's actually something you want to do. I took an internship with the NBA team during the lockout a couple summers ago, last summer, I guess. I won't say, because it wasn't a good experience, but uh, I, I was going there to be a new media intern. and. It turned out being a new media intern there meant building a website that they would use during the lockout because the regular website was going offline. So I was sitting there with Dreamweaver editing a web, like designing and creating a website. That's a great skill to have. It's a skill I absolutely hate having and hate doing because building a website from scratch for an NBA team is not what I signed up for. When I had talked to them, I was gonna be doing some stories and videos. I got the chance to do a little bit of that. I was interviewing cheerleaders, which was interesting. Um, I, I got the t sure. chance to talk to draft picks as well. So I mean, there was some good, but try, the interview is a two-way process. Ask them what they expect of you and what you will be doing, and if it's something you actually want to do. Because if, if it isn't something you want to do, it's going to be a, a long couple of months. I think that's where we will leave it. So, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for our panelists here. Thank you so, so much.